in every conversation, we would ask, what do we know works and what do we know doesn't work? And I was struck by how many of the doesn't work conversations came back to data practices, how we use data to identify needs and what we do in response. There were incredible stories of individual cases as well as school-wide systems that really responded to and pinpointed the root cause and provided a solution that made a game-changing difference for students. But there were also lots of cautionary tales about data malpractice, about ways that we might use data to label and sort students, or treatments that really did nothing or even did damage to the student need. Clearly, no plan is gonna work for every student. Clearly, students are going to bring a broad range of learning needs, particularly in this time. How do schools really create effective practices of using data to understand those needs and meet them? Here's some of what we heard. Years ago, I taught um, a small kindergarten class, all students um, with autism and, and special needs. And we had one student with autism who the interventions we were doing weren't really effective. We were having, um, we just, the data wasn't moving. We weren't moving the mark and, and we weren't being effective. And we were looking at it from, trying to figure out what the perspective was, um, but there were a variety of issues. It wasn't just the data on the paper. And so when you walked in this classroom, sometimes you would see this child try to climb the walls like Spider-Man and leap off of them. And sometimes you would see him roll himself up into my circle time carpet like a burrito. And so this was all a part of what made up this child and who he was. Well, our occupational therapist came in and saw that and she said, you know, we really need to be spinning him. We need to put together, a pro I'll put together a protocol for you to implement and follow, you know, with my guidance, but he needs vestibular input that he's not getting. Mm -hmm. And so with the protocol she put into place, we were able to, he was able to sit at the table and do the interventions and do the academic work, whereas he wasn't before. So just looking at straight data on paper doesn't give you the full picture. We have a, a phrase that the world of autism uses that you've met one child with autism, you've met one child with autism. And that's true for children in general. Um, children are all unique individuals and we really need to look at the bigger picture and the whole child to see what, what they need. There are lots of different reasons that students might not be engaging in school. And if you're just kind of letting things go like, oh, you know, they just don't care or, you know, oh, you kind of make it, or they're like excuses, oh, they can't do it for this reason or that reason. Well, the students fall behind and the more that they fall behind, the harder it is to catch up. They get frustrated, they feel embarrassed, and that makes them withdraw further. Like students don't ask for help, you know, when they need it. Mm -hmm. They get embarrassed and then they do less, right? So they don't want to. So it really took these systems where teachers would reach out to students, find out what's going on, and then they could problem solve around, well, what is happening? How do we deal with whatever this is? You know, it, and there's so many different things. It could be, you know, taking care of a sick parent or, fear of a bully in school, not getting along with a teacher. You know, there's so many different things, but you have mm -hmm. to figure those things out. And then there's some things that once you start getting together, you know, teachers in the school, you see systematic things that are influencing lots of students. So, or like as a teacher, you don't know what to do with on your own, but you can figure out strategies together. I think there's a lot of conversation right now about diagnostics and assessments and understanding where students are. and and in response to COVID, but I don't, I don't necessarily know if we've always come back to the idea of even before COVID, our assessments were not doing the job that we needed them to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know if we would, if I personally would have put a stamp on any assessment as giving teachers or educators the tools that they needed to really strongly inform their instructional practice. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to decide as a, as a nation and country, what are these assessments for? Are they simply to give us a benchmark for students or are they are they to drive instruction? The things that we've seen that um, tend to be less effective, one, hyper-individualization. Um, we are motivated to learn with others. We are social beings and we are also beings that um, learn through discourse. I think to provide an example of something very um, early on in the blended learning movement, you know, when we were thinking about, okay, how might technology be supportive of English language learning students, excuse me, students who are English language learners. Um, 
we thought, oh, great, we're going to we're going to be able to give kids access to content in whatever home language they have. We're going to be able mm -hmm. to give them um, really like custom language tutoring through Duolingo and all these great programs. And yes, we were able to do that, but we also denied them access to like rigorous academic discourse that could have been super helpful for accelerating them more quickly. Mm -hmm. And so we had to figure out, oh, there's a balance between the intervention for the child and our, our work around like social learning, not just for the purposes of motivation, but for the purposes of exposure to exposure. academic language, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think it would be super tempting in the fall to like think, okay, what's the, what's the hyper level of like personalization or individualization, mm -hmm. but in reality, we really have to balance it. We have to be willing to look at data with complexity, like complexity in mind and do the mm -hmm. triangulation mm -hmm. and listen to our instincts as educators too, when we know something is wrong, because kids mm -hmm. will give us data when something is wrong. And oftentimes yeah. it will be in the form of not academic data, but behavioral information they're providing us back and, um, and what they're saying to us in the classroom. Like it's great that we're wanting to maximize our beginning of year assessment data, but making sure that we completely understand the purpose of those assessments and, and the limits of them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that we don't then unfortunately like overload teachers with a lot of data that isn't necessarily actionable on a day to day. This notion of assessments of various types um, is super important now. We um, believe that data is important. For sure, that data is important. Um, and who needs to know what is certainly part of this conversation right now. Um, but oftentimes when we think about assessment practice, we think about kind of like two things that concern me. One is like, how do we use assessments to label and sort kids, which isn't always what is most helpful. Mm -hmm. And two, how do we use assessments to identify students' deficits rather than using assessments to identify students' strengths? And so what we see is an over-reliance on commercial products that are used uh, because we don't trust teachers' judgment about what kids know and are able to do. So districts employ things we labeled interim assessments, and those are often administered two to three times a year with some purported instructional use. I don't understand how it could be instructionally useful if it only happens two or three times a year, right? Because you, you just can't group the kids in the fall and then leave them in those groups until the winter. If you don't have a high quality curriculum, in some ways, you have a bigger problem that assessment could solve. Mm -hmm. because, so mm -hmm. what I keep saying is like, sounds funny. The guy who heads the Center for Assessment is saying it's not an assessment problem, but it's mm -hmm. not. It's mm -hmm. a curriculum and, and instructional and school organization problem that mm -hmm. needs to be solved. So I've been reading these um, reports on teachers' study of data for a long time. Um, you know the, this is a really common activity in schools. You go into many schools and they have grade level teams and what the grade level teams spend a lot of their time on, not all, but a lot of their time on is, uh, you know, studying student assessment data, whether that be a state test, not very often state tests, but often interim assessments, often assessments that teachers design or they're collecting data from kids in other ways. And there's been, I think I located 11 or 12 studies of these kinds of programs and policies um, where, you know, formative assessment or a, not formative assessment, an interim assessment or mm -hmm. a, you know, some kind of data was brought in and there's a process for teachers to study it and think about what it means for practice. The results there were just flat across the board. There is a lot of criticism about data teams and teachers mm -hmm. working with data. And at the heart of it, um, at the heart of that criticism is that data does not um, lead to differences in student learning. And it's mm -hmm. true, without that um, rigorous conversation that teachers need to have and content and pedagogical knowledge, just giving them data won't, won't mm -hmm. help them. What they do, what we found in our research is that they tend to respond to data by making groups of students to mm -hmm. regroup or to again, focus a lot more on structure instead of in the instruction itself. Mm -hmm. um, now they have different groups of students, but the kind of pedagogic 
pedagogy they're delivering may not be truly differentiated, but they've just put students into different groups. Um, the other thing teachers often do when they have data is they just reteach or review the same thing they did before without mm -hmm. actually changing anything. Mm -hmm. So they just say, oh, that group needs more um, of the same practice. And maybe they do for some skills, but often what happens is they, the students actually need that content taught in a different way. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. they didn't master it the first time. So um, what doesn't work is, is just relying on the fact that teachers have the data to actually make that change in their instruction. We sometimes hear and have seen that um, what, will, what will happen is because I value you family, I know you don't have the skill to support this academic partnership. So I'm not going to share academic information. I'm only going mm -hmm. to call you and share the behavior information, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's problematic. <laughs> mm -hmm. on so many levels because those academic partnerships are built not just around academics but social emotional development mm -hmm. that is just as important and that's where we see and know that families have funds and knowledge that educators simply do not have mm -hmm. and they are the experts and their children so we must mm -hmm. treat them as such i think we need to listen to students more mm -hmm. i mean they 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 they're feelings and feedback about their experience is relevant. And I think we've sort of taken a sage on the stage mentality when it comes to students, as opposed to wait, you know, let's be more Socratic about this and learn from what our students have to say. And so I think that to me, what's not worked is going back to your question is us thinking we have all the answers, right? Mm -hmm. And um, as you know, um, you know, our students, whether it's a student that's acting out that's data, that's information. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a student who was having a social issue, whether it's hunger or um, home, you know, displacement from their home, that's data, that's information. And it's those sorts of data and feedback and information have told us, hey, we might need to make sure there's a food pantry in the school district, mm -hmm. right? The, this mm -hmm. information tells us, oh, we might need to uh, implement a, an after school program. Oh, these data tell us we might need to have an early childhood program for pre-K. So. If you think about the best programs that have evolved over time, they came from information that we got from students, either directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I would say for us in the future to continue to listen to our students, tap into them, understand their experience, and not be afraid to then develop policies and programs that are responsive to that. Across these conversations, I had three takeaways. One, no instructional plan is going to work for all students in the same way. As educators, we must put in place the best plan we can, but we also must be ready to understand who it is not working for and determine how to meet their needs. Two, learning needs cannot be identified by a single test. It will always require judgment, multiple perspectives, and should in particular prioritize student and family voice. Three, individual learning needs do not always benefit from individual solutions we must always remember that learning is social. Next up, theme six, our last theme, the way teachers support students mirrors the way leaders support teachers. Thanks for watching.